Hi, Stephen here. Before we start with this week's episode, speaking to Kendra, we wanted to let you know that this discussion includes experiences and topics that are of a sensitive nature. We talk about Kendra's experience of, and her research into, extreme forms of so-called purity culture and what this sometimes leads to, including the physical and sexual abuse of women and children. For some of our listeners, this may be difficult to listen to, so please exercise care. Thank you. Hello cult hackers and welcome to the podcast. I'm Celine, a media graduate with an interest in cults. And I'm her dad. I'm Stephen Mather. I was raised in a high control group or cult. Um, I left when I was about 30, about the time you were born, Celine. Um, <laughs> So, yeah, I'm these days I'm an organizational psychologist, so I'm very interested in how these sorts of groups work. Um, yeah, so welcome to the podcast, everyone. Right. So we've got a lovely guest with us today. So we've got Kendra, who's been sharing her story of growing up in an evangelical cult and being raised under the How to Train a Child Doctrine of the Pearls. Um, she's been blowing up on social media, so really excited to have her on the show. And well, Thank yeah, you welcome, so much. Kendra. <laughs> Thank you both so much for your kindness and for your invitation to be on your show today. Yeah, thank you so much for taking us up on it. <laughs> um, would you be able to tell us sort of what group you were raised in? Because we said evangelical sort of group. Would you be able to tell us a little bit what that kind of means? Yeah, absolutely. So there is a, a group of more fundamentalist um, evangelical groups within, especially within the Bible Belt of the United States. Obviously, it's all over the world, but it's very heavily influenced here in the Bible Belt. So mm -hmm. I grew up in a religious cult that, like you mentioned, it very closely follows a lot of the um, more absurd type of teachings when it comes to child rearing, as they call it, or child training, as well as very submissive women, the long, you know, the long dresses, the no television, no electricity. So it was very, very um, off the grid, very weird. And, um, you know, the whole world was made out to be just a very horrible place for us to be at. So the whole idea was that we were being protected from the outside world by living so primitive um, and of course, like you mentioned, some of these teachings and trainings just got really extreme and my parents just kind of followed those teachings and led all seven of us kids down that same path. I guess, what was it kind of like for you growing up in that? So that's the, the setting, like, what was that from a personal level? How was that like? Well, I think at the time you don't know any better really, <laughs> because my family really got involved in that type of lifestyle about the time I, I think I was like six or seven. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I have some memories prior to that age, but the majority of my memories come from a little bit later in life when we were involved in it. So I was homeschooled from start to finish. I went to public school for kindergarten, <laughs> which mm -hmm. doesn't really count. And so, um, I was homeschooled the rest of my life. And, and when you're raised that way, just out of the, out of, of the public entirely, you don't know any better. It's kind of like your, you know, your no sense of normal is really messed up, but that is your normal. And so it really wasn't until I was out for years that I really started to kind of unpack and figure out how messed up it really was. Mm -hmm. But at the time, you know, being in a big family, being taught these crazy things is just, um, it just was what it was kind of thing. That's not to say that it wasn't really upsetting, especially, you know, being abused and being um, treated so horribly by my parents specifically, you know, that was a, ho a horrible environment to grow up in. But again, you're taught that that's normal and that's, you're following the teachings of Jesus, right? So mm -hmm. <laughs> at the time it was just, it was a really messed up sense of normal. It's that question of when when you start seeing cracks or when you start thinking, is this right or is this how it has to be? Did that ever start seeping? Right. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Mm -hmm. um, and I was always called like the bad child, the rebellious child for that reason, because I would ask questions. And then one thing about, as you both know, with high control high demand groups, especially religious groups, you're not allowed to ask questions. They don't want you to ask questions outside of the doctrine that you're being taught. And so anytime I would ask questions, I was, you know, told I'm like being a troublemaker, or just trying to cause problems or rebelling against God, or that Satan trying to infiltrate my mind. Um, 
And so there were cracks in, in different things. And I'm like, ah, this can't, if, you know, if, if this is heaven, then, you know, what is hell like? Because, you know, this, how I'm being raised is supposedly close to God, but this is not what I thought God would feel like, you know, I thought God was love and this isn't, this doesn't feel like love to me. So, um, there were cracks in it for sure from a young age, different things that made me think like, I, this is, I don't want to, I don't want to be in this. Um, I've spoken about it before, but I would, you know, I would dream about being kidnapped just so I could get out of that type of environment. You know, that's oh, wow. a really weird thing to say, I suppose, but, uh, it is genuinely, I, I can't tell you how many times I thought about that. I, I would run, want to run away from home, which I'm sure a lot of kids want to growing up, but I was, so scared of the outside world. You know, I didn't know what was out there. I didn't know what to expect. I was just always talked, you know, told that the outside world was something to fear and something to escape from. Um, and so I'd never did try to run away because I thought, you know, <laughs> that would be the end of me <laughs> type yes. of thing. So, um, but then, uh, especially my older teen years, that's when I was really starting to be, you know, have, a better sense of that, you know, the outside world may, it might not be as evil as I've been taught that it is. And so those cracks started to get bigger. And, um, I ended up running away when I was 18, which technically an adult, but I, I waited until I was 18. So they wouldn't be able to bring me back into that environment. Mm -hmm. Um, in this, in the state of Arkansas, where I lived, it was, you know, you had to be 18 to be considered an adult. So I'm, did end up leaving home at that time and um, best decision I ever made. I, I was going to ask about, um, you mentioned fear. Uh, and that's something that I think that lots of us who were raised in these groups um, experienced a lot. And it, it becomes a kind of chronic condition in, in some respects. Um, I wonder whether you're able to, as much as you want to, obviously, um, talk a little bit about how, how fear was kind of part a normal part of your life and what you were afraid of and uh, what what that was like gosh that's a great question because it is it's such an important part of i think religious cults in general but just speaking from my own experience with the fundamentalist group everything is fear based it's uh, you know we're always being protected and we were always told like you know if we were out and if we went to public school, that's the reason we weren't allowed to go to public school is because we would be persecuted for Christ. We, you know, we were the reason there were school shootings is because people wanted to kill Christians. And so if we were in public yeah. school, then, you know, undoubtedly, then we would be put in that situation where we would have to choose between God or living. Um, so that was one of the examples. Um, but also just the constant, the constant fear around disappointing God about the fear about, um, accidentally, you know, seducing men just by existing. And that, you know, that would result in a rape or a pregnancy or like, you know, the fear of the wow. constantly the rapture with Christ coming back in the lake of fire. Like it's there's, you're being just, everything is so fear-based. Um, and so obviously fear is used as a tactic to get people to do what you want them to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. That's that's. I mean, let's let's just sort of um, itemize those. So we've we've got. Um, you're talking about their fear of um, fear of seducing men. So if 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 a man was to um, attack you or do something to you, then actually that would be your fault. Is that is that oh, the oh, yeah. implication? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. I remember. I remember one time I was like in the car with my mom driving somewhere and I just looked over at the car beside us, you know, that was like passing us. And my mom was like, don't make eye contact with that man. Cause he's going to follow us. And you know, that could lead to you, you or me getting raped and killed. Like oh just goodness. think like literally just day to day incidences that are just normal, you know, just looking at the car passing you is turned into this. You're bringing it on yourself. If you were to get hurt in some way. That's that's yeah. I mean that's that's shocking, isn't it? And that is bound to have an effect age. on your yeah your your thinking. Um, and then you, you've also talked about fear of of the rapture. So a lot of our um, listeners, not all of them by any means, and and as we 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 get more listeners, then I think it becomes a bit more diverse. But um, a lot of our listeners may have been ex Jehovah's Witnesses, which is the mm. the 
group that I was a member of. And that's something that we didn't really talk about at all. We had no concept of the rapture. So I wonder if really? uh, just for the benefit of me and and other listeners like me, you could explain to us what the rapture was. Oh, yeah, I'm happy to. Um, that's interesting. I, I, you know, you gotta get in your own bubble of religion. Mm. And you assume that all these other groups think the same things. But of course, that's not the case. But yeah, so the rapture is basically the second coming of Christ, which is talked about in the book of Revelation in the Bible and the King James Bible that we used. But there would be all of these, you know, week long revivals or preachings up just on the book of Revelation, just on the rapture. And it's all about like how if you're not saved and you don't believe, you know, the King James Bible and you don't believe a certain way, then you will be left behind on earth and everyone else will be taken into heaven. So basically, like the trumpets will sound and Jesus will appear in the clouds and all of the dead in Christ, like people who have already passed on will rise up from their graves and go to heaven. And then all those who are remaining here on earth will also, if you're saved and you believe a certain way, then you will also be called up into heaven. And then once you're called up into heaven, basically the earth goes to hell in a handbasket with fires and just destruction and carnage. And so, you know, as a little child, you're like, Mm. well, I don't want to be left here and all my family's going up to heaven. And like, I'm going to be here and just be subjected to this like free for all. (laughs) Um, And so, uh, but yeah, when when that's like put in your head, like you said, Celine, like from a young age, it's like, it's so normal. You just, and so many people here still 100% believe that even if they're not technically fundamentalist or like I'm telling you, like in the United States, especially here in the South, every I'm like the majority of people believe in the second coming of Christ and in the rapture. And so, um, yeah, you don't have to be Baptist or independent fundamentalist to believe that just so many people here are Uh under that, that mindset. So very, very fear-based. Um, and how I was brought up was kind of like, what they say, once saved, always saved. So once you ask Jesus into your heart, then you can't lose your salvation. But as a kid, I would wake up crying in the middle of the night. I remember several times I'd wake up crying in the middle of the night and go to my parents' bedroom and be like, what if I didn't get saved right? Like the first time. So I would always have doubts like, okay, well, if, what if I didn't mean it enough? Or what if I didn't say the right words enough? Or what, what if I wasn't genuine enough? Then if the rupture were to happen now, I'm still going to be left behind because I somehow I didn't do it right or genuine or authentically enough the first time. So regard, even if once you get saved, quote unquote, get saved, it's like you still have all those doubts. Like you're, Mm -hmm. you're still going to be left behind. So it's just constant fear. Um, I I may have mentioned it before. I'm not sure, but even (laughs) it's so embarrassing. (laughs) Even now, sometimes I'll walk into an empty room and have like that immediately, like, like clench in my gut. Like I'm, I thought someone was supposed to be here and they're not here. And so I feel like I got left behind, even though I don't believe any of that anymore, but it's so ingrained in you. Sometimes it's just like, you're, you're just snap, you know, subconscious mm-hmm. is like, oh shit, like I'm going to be, I got left behind. So it just, yeah. I, and I've been out, I've, I've been out 15 years. I mean, that that's so interesting. And and what I find, first of all, we're kind of giggling a bit about it because it, it kind of sounds ridiculous to us now. But of course, um, at the time, it's it's really frightening, especially for a child um, to grow up in that situation. So we it's part of, I think it's part mm-hmm. of a defense mechanism to kind of make light of it. But actually, yeah, for sure. It's pretty it's pretty scary when you're in it. So um I recognize so much of that. The the belief system of Jehovah's Witnesses is is, is sort of flipped. So the idea is that um, Armageddon's coming. So they, they believe in the second coming of Jesus. Armageddon is coming just the same. But they believe that um, he's going to destroy all the wicked people um, and only the good people will survive. And they'll live forever on Earth. So the Earth ends up being a paradise and all the bad people get killed and um done away with forever Interesting. so that's that's the sort of different take but it's still that the same fear is there but this time it's fear of dying at armageddon basically right and, right. and not being with your family mm-hmm. and um, all your loved ones in in the new system which is is what you're you're what you're hoping for but this this idea of oh did i do that right and maybe when i did that wrong thing you know i i I did it again. And, um, you know, in the Bible, it says that a course of sin is like sinning against the Holy Spirit. And that's right. Uh, the fact that I did it twice means that um, maybe I've sinned against the Holy Spirit. You know, it's it's all that sort of thing. And I recognize that in what you're mm. saying. 
Absolutely. And it, it, there's so many parallels with, it seems like Jehovah's Witness and, and, and how I was raised because it's like, they, they want us to be martyrs so bad, even when there's no actual threat of being martyrs or being persecuted for Christ, there's, but that's how they keep you in it. It's like they create an us versus them mentality. And once they have created us versus them, then that's kind of how you keep your followers into the cult or into those high demand, high control groups. Um, and it, you know, you're over here as a child thinking you're going to have to go, what fight in Armageddon, <laughs> like, and defend your faith. Like that's, that's terrifying. Yeah. Persecution was the thing we were told was, was going to happen. Definitely. You know, so, um, always worried about, uh, some sort of persecution. Um, well, so yeah. Me, yeah. You told me you were worried that they'd be looking for like your congregation and that you were worried about telling them where you're where they were and that you'd mm. let it go because they'd be trying to find mm. the other congregation members and that as a child you're worried about saving all this all these people wow. from being found that's an awful burden <laughs> right you can't even be a child you like I've, I've said that to someone before I'm like yeah. you know everyone is a child but not everyone has a childhood you know because and that's what it is and you know like you like you said it's like you don't, you're as a child, you're thinking about what you're going to do as protecting the whole congregation <laughs> that, 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 uh, disconnects you from the ability to really experience what it is to be a child and just live a childhood. So it's very damaging long-term. I think so. Yeah. And blood guilt was something we, we were talked about a lot. I don't know whether that's a concept that you experienced Kendra, the idea of blood guilt. I'm not familiar with that exact term, so, but I so, wonder if there's a parallel. Yeah, probably is. I'm sure there is. <laughs> um, so blood guilt was the, um, the the way that you might be responsible for somebody else's death um, by oh doing something God. or not doing something. So um, if so, we were very much about preaching, obviously. And so if you didn't preach, um, they might die at arm again. This person that actually might listen to you, but you miss that opportunity to do some preaching. Um, if they die at Armageddon, of course, it, it could be my fault because I failed to preach to them at the moment that that might have actually made the difference. Uh, that's another great wow. weight on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> is is that why Jehovah's Witnesses are so persistent? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that make, you actually that makes a lot of sense. Oh my yeah. gosh, that is an enormous weight. Like yeah. uh, I got to try hard and go above and beyond all the time. That's exhausting. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Because yeah, yeah. yeah, if you're in, because you were in um, public school, like you know, um, so you, you kind of thought, should I be preaching to these kids at school? And it's already hard at school being, yeah, you know, the the, the uber religious kid. <laughs> but um, you know, it's like, oh, should I be preaching to these kids? You go home, you're like, would could I have convinced them today? It's mm -hmm. just right. If Armageddon yeah. happens tomorrow, did I do enough Thanks today to, you know, win yeah. children? <laughs> that's that's so crazy yeah did you know it's estimated that there are over three million podcasts currently out there so trying to get noticed and grow listeners is really hard if you're enjoying this podcast why not tell a friend about it we can be found on all the podcast apps so please tell them to search for cult hackers in fact why not pause the show right here and do it now you can find the pod link on our show notes. So you can just copy and paste it into a message or share it using your app. Thank you. Now back to the podcast. We kind of touched on it already. So just kind of jumping a little bit onto something you mentioned. So obviously we talked about, yeah, sort of position of women a little bit with, you know, in terms of how men would respond or hit responsibility, which is completely awful. But um I guess that falls into the sort of category of purity culture. And I think you've talked a little bit about that on your um, reels and things like that. Um, so is that, I guess that's quite a major pillar of your, of this group and growing up in this group, um, the whole kind of, yeah, purity culture. Is that purity, something you'd be able yeah. to talk about a little bit? Of course. Or? Yeah. So purity culture is exactly, it is a huge pillar in the, in my upbringing and just the evangelical world in general, there is so much emphasis put on the purity of specifically girls. They do, you know, the purity culture movement, you know, heavy on the cult part of culture in that <laughs> statement. Um, you know, it goes back 
thousands of years or hundreds of years at least, but it kind of had a revamping in the early 90s here in the States through evangelical um, organizations such as like True Love Waits um, and very independent fundamentalist type of organizations. Anyway, so purity culture is essentially teaching children to practice 100% abstinence before marriage. But more so than that, it was not just abstaining from sex, but sexual thoughts, um, doing anything such as how, sp- specifically women, how we're dressed, causing men to sin. Again, from, you know, like before puberty, you're being taught that how you dress could cause a brother in Christ to stumble and to sin. And therefore, you're responsible for his sin. So if you were to be raped or molested, it is always brought back on you. What what were you doing? How were you dressed? How were you acting? Mm-hmm. Did you make eye contact with him? Were you flirtatious in any way? You know, were you wearing a skirt that was, you know, an inch too short? Whatever it is, it's, you know, it's always brought back on the women. I've spoken about it before, but, you know, this is also the case. And even once you're married, it's, you know, if your husband steps out on you, it's your fault because you're not, you must not be doing enough for him in your marriage because he wouldn't have stepped out on you. Or if he abuses you or your kids, um, you're, you must be sending somewhere to cause this to happen to you. Um, so yeah, purity culture runs so deep, but it is incredibly damaging. Um, it, it causes like this huge separation from you and your body. It, it causes so much shame and guilt and distrust of self. Um, and that's, that's again, another way of, that they break you down and kind of mold you into who they want you to be is to separate you from yourself and, and cause, um, a lack of trust and, in yourself and your intuition and just make you feel constant shame it's um it's something we talked about um recently as well because it's you know something that luckily there's more of a light being shone on it at the moment people are starting to sort of um, talk a lot more about the this sort of yeah this purity culture and how damaging it is um to to women and men in these groups because it creates these uncomfortable really at the best at the best uncomfortable relationships with terrible mm-hmm. dynamics and at worst like you said abuses and things like that um we we're talking as well about how it affects the sort of relationship um between uh partners so you when they're together um like married couples where uh i know in the jw's they will um say if, say if a marriage is struggling and it's and there's a woman that's quite um dominant quote unquote mm-hmm. um, you know, she's just allowed a woman she's you know, right. she's better at making decisions or you know she right. just takes the lead they'll kind of say well that's the reason your marriage is suffering it's because you know you've got a domineering woman is that so, something you would see in your group as well oh oh yes um yeah. and there may be more <laughs> there may be more dominant women behind the scenes I think my mother actually was one of those women <laughs> um but she, in my opinion there's <laughs> There's usually like one abuser in the family that's uh, more dominant. And then there's one who's more complicit to the abuse that's happening. And so my mom was the more active, loud, like um, forceful abuser. And my dad kind of was more, you know, complacent. Mm -hmm. And so on, on the front side of things, like towards the church people, towards the cult and the organizations and services, my mom was reserved and meek and quiet, just like the Bible says, you know, women should be, but behind the scenes, it was very much the decision maker and kind of the abuser and more forceful one. So, but regardless, like you said, we're not allowed to really be opinionated or make decisions on the forefront of things. So anything like that would definitely be behind the scenes, or you would just be called a rebellious woman or, you know, you're sitting or you're not right with Christ and because you're not submitting to your husband. And that's, that's the basis of it. That's why they raise girls up in this purity culture is to be subservient and submissive to men once we're married. Um, and so, you know, that goes across the board. You don't just be, you, you don't get raised that way and then enter into a marriage and then suddenly your opinion matters and your value you know, your value increases. So it is very much the same. That's why they train you that way. So what, what do you think um, in your experience, what does that do to uh, obviously you've experienced what that does to, to you as a woman. Um, and I'm also interested in your observations about what you think that does to men within this society. Um, I, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that. 
uh, <laughs> I always have thoughts yeah, <laughs> on that because <laughs> it, it gets me, it, it just gets me really riled up. So, um, yes. Yeah, so I, I speak a lot about how it affects women because as a woman, that's my experience. And sure. I try not to speak for, for men in their experience. However, um, you know, I, I have relationships with men like friends, or I grew up with men who are out now and, and just hearing their experience or even followers who've messaged me, it is really damaging for men as well, because we're, you know, we're taught that, you know, the whole idea in saving yourself for marriage is because you're going to have this beautiful, like, um, a spiritual awakening once you're married and your sex life is just going to be incredible. But what ends up happening according to research and studies that I've read is that it actually contributes a huge amount to um, issues in the bedroom for men because they, you know, there's all of this pressure. There's all of this fear. They feel the shame as well. Um, they don't, you know, they don't know what to to do with this. And so it's, you know, it causes a lot of issues um, for men and women. Obviously, I think there's a huge line between the purity culture and pedophilia, um, just based on how they they train boys and girls to act and behave. They train boys to grow up to treat women this way or to look at little girls as sex objects because they're, you know, they're causing them to sin. They also cover a lot um, if there is abuse, the church covers it up and they will tell men like, you know, they're having all of these urges or they've, you know, they've sexually molested children. And the best thing that they advise men to do is to get married because that will quote unquote, get it out of their system. So instead of taking it to the authorities, um, they will just handle it internally, marry them off to a woman. And then the woman is subjected to this pedophile, you know, and then they end up having children together. And it's just this repeated cycle of just like this horrible trauma and damage that's just accepted, widely accepted. And so even if men don't grow up to repeat that exact behavior, they grow up um, feeling an enormous amount of shame from what I've been told and um, that they're going to become that way or, uh, you know, they're taught to abuse women in this way. And so even if it doesn't feel good to them, they're taught this is the way God designed it. You are up here and the woman is beneath you and then the children. So um, from from just what I've heard men speak about that, you know, it's incredibly damaging them, to them as well, just in a very different way. Yeah, it's, it's, it can't be a healthy um, way of understanding about your sexu- sexuality, I, I would say. Obviously, I'm not an expert, but um, I feel like it's not um, a healthy way to start to discover who you are and, um, you know, your sexual life is is an important part of who you are. And that's just um, – I, and I, I don't, know, don't know what you think, but it feels to me like there's a, a strange – obsession with sex amongst these sorts of groups and and i would say the same for jehovah's witnesses i wouldn't describe them in quite the same way that that you described the group that you you were raised in but i there was still a, a i think an unhealthy emphasis on things like not committing immorality and no sex before marriage and even you know thoughts um of a sexual nature and so on and i i just don't see that as healthy uh, unsurprising that that men and women struggle, I think, later when they've been raised in that sort of environment. Yes. And that does, and to your point, I mean, that doesn't even touch on like, you know, the LGBTQ community as well, which a large part of my family, surprisingly enough, has come out since Mm. then, even my extended family. And so it, any, there's so much shame. So if, if, if a guy is gay like they're so they're vilified they're taught to like be shamed for that and um god it's just it's it's horrible it's so damaging not to mention like the conversion therapy that they force you know kids to go to i I mean it's just it's horrible um i spoke to um uh john in a it is in a previous episode and he said um you know he he realized he was gay and he tried to you know, he read about conversion therapy and tried to yeah. do it to himself because he thought, I've got to oh, deal with this, you oh. know. And because that's yeah. how they, it's awful, isn't yeah. it? And that's, you yeah. know, what they're teaching. Because like you said, the guilt and the fear of, you know, Armageddon or the rapture, it, you, you want right. to quite, quite be ready for that. So I guess, you know, it's not surprising that people try and take it into their own hands to deal with it when that level of fear is being, you know, 
kept on you all the time. Right. Or the rate of suicide, even mm-hmm. from kids who mm-hmm. are, are not free to talk about it or ashamed in, mm-hmm. or just, you know, vilified for their sexuality. And mm-hmm. regardless of whether you're gay or straight, your sexuality, especially as a woman is treated with disgust and shame, like I said before. So, I mean, you're the way I thought about it. And I know many of the girls were the same way and women now is um, we did, we never wanted to have sex. Even when we were married, it was just like, it was so vilified. Like I said, like it was not something we ever wanted to do or looked forward to doing. It was just like panic, panic around it. Because when so much of your identity is tied to being pure and chaste and, you know, pure for Christ and like you're the virgin of Christ, you know, then when that's gone and it's like, well, then what am I? I'm reduced to, you know, a skeleton of a person that I was when I had my virginity and you can't undo that overnight. You know, even though on a logical level, we understand, you know, that's not the case, but again, it's so deeply ingrained and indoctrinated in you. You can't, you can't just undo that. Um, And I've been doing a lot of research on statistics when it comes to purity culture and um, yeah, studies show that purity culture actually is more harmful to um, when it comes to STIs and premarital pregnancies, like the rate is so much higher for that in the groups of people who were in the purity culture movement and signed these purity contracts and things like that versus their peers who weren't because instead of teaching safe sex or education around it, they teach, just don't do it, which yeah. we know it's going to happen. And also the purity culture movement statistically did not even help. It's no one, it didn't actually lower, um, you know, premarital sex at all or abstinence. All it did was shame kids for it. So they would lie about it or have sex and then try to repent a hundred times because they felt all this guilt about not getting into heaven or for disappointing God. Um, and then of course, when you don't teach safe sex, then your risk of um, STIs and all of that goes up. And so it's just, it's more, it does way more harm than good. You, you mentioned purity contracts there so um so we're based in the uk and um we uh, that's something that i don't think we see very much in in the uk although maybe i'm wrong um but it seems to be something much more around this um sort of evangelical um sort of side of things do you want to just help us to understand what that means what is a purity contract yeah so back to the true love weights movement that happened in the early 90s um i'm I, i've been out of this uh, religion for so long. I'm not sure if it still takes place, but I imagine to a degree, it probably still does. Um, But yes, they would have purity contracts that um, specifically girls would sign pledging their purity and their virginity to their dads prior to marriage, which again, plays into that pedophilia. It's disgusting. It's gross. I don't see how anyone ever thought that was okay. Um, But you know, like little girls, like three, four or five year old girls would be signing these contracts, pledging to stay pure until marriage. Um, And then of course there was the purity jewelry, the purity rings, the purity necklaces that fathers would give to their daughters. Um, I did see boys occasionally sporting the rings, but you would wear them on like your wedding ring finger um, only to be taken off when you get married and replace it with the actual wedding ring. So it's just very bizarre, creepy behavior. Um, and I, I made a video this past week about that as well, but they would have purity balls where, where dads, um, would escort their daughters who were dressed in white dresses, like a bride's, um, like a bridal gown and escort them to a ball. And essentially like they would have this whole ceremony. They would have like, you know, you lay roses at the feet of your dad, like he's Christ essentially and pledge your virginity and your purity to him. I mean, there's pictures, you can go online and find pictures of girls signing contracts to their dads during these ceremonies, which I don't know how anyone doesn't think this is a cult when you hear these types of things, because this is not logical. Like it's insane behavior. Um, but yeah, so it was very much treated almost like a pre-wedding for the, for your wedding to your future husband, which again, you're not allowed to date. You're not allowed, of course, premarital sex. Mm -hmm. It was only courtship. It's what they call courtship. So essentially your parents would pick out 
who they thought was a good fit for you, who was a godly man. Um, and then you would court this person. And the whole thing with courting is everything has to be chaperoned. Your parents or their parents are always present on dates or outings. You're never left alone. Of course, you're not allowed to kiss or hold hands, anything like that. I think you can hold hands like when you're engaged. Um, but courtship is always <laughs> right. <laughs> what a reward. <laughs> um, <laughs> they're getting a little crazy, a little promiscuous. Um, <laughs> so, but, um, um, so courtship is all about just getting to marriage because you only court someone if you plan to marry them. Mm-hmm. So, um, it's basically as quick as possible. Courtships are usually pretty short term. You might court for a couple months and then immediately wow. plan a wedding. Mm-hmm. You gotta, you yeah. gotta get married so you can start having babies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then we haven't even talked about, it. I haven't even made videos about it, but then there's the whole quiverful movement, which is about not using birth control and letting God decide how many children you're going to have. You don't space your, your pregnancies out. You, whenever you get pregnant, it's, it's because it's the will of God. So of course there's no birth control or, mm-hmm. or family planning, anything like that. So it's really all about what you want to replenish your congregation. You, that's how you keep a cult alive. You don't want it to die out. So um, yeah, then the whole quiverful movement is about that as well. Mm-hmm. So it's just, it's so layered. There's so many layers. Yeah. So is that how they, so obviously done so good jo- uh, Jehovah's witnesses, they'll preach. So go, you know, door to door and things like that. And, you know, kind of, um, try and bring more members through that is it more yeah through you know families having children and that's how the kind of group carries on rather than preaching or is it a bit of a mix of both yeah it's a mix of both because we would go out door to door sometimes like the jehovah's witness but we probably looked more ridiculous at least y'all were like more clean cut <laughs> and had, you know wait i don't know if you wear ties i can't remember no, we <laughs> but you know y'all ties. Okay. <laughs> so it's very boys much have like, ties. <laughs> <laughs> ugh, like ugh, makes me claustrophobic <laughs> thinking about it. Um <laughs> but we probably like looking back, it's so embarrassing because it's like, oh, we probably looked ridiculous with like our homemade clothing, because you know, all of my floor length dresses were hand sewn and just very little house on the prairie. Right. Um, but or even more so like, ugh, just so I can't imagine opening my door and seeing a group of girls dressed like that. It's like it just had to be ridiculous. But yeah, we would go door to door like that as well. Ooh. Um and then w- one time um in my late teens, I was allowed to go on a mission trip to the Zuni Pueblo reservation in New Mexico and witness uh for Christ out there which gosh, it just, that's a whole nother thing. But, um, but yeah, we would still go door to door, but I don't think we were as, you know, we weren't on it as much as the Jehovah's witness. So you guys had a speech in that department. I'll give you that. That was, uh, that was our thing. Yeah. Um, (laughs) Yeah. We we didn't really meet many in my experience. We didn't meet many other groups that did it. Mormons were the other ones that did it. Mm -hmm. Uh, It was always funny. You know, we, if you had a, couple of mormons and jehovah's witnesses in the same territory sometimes that would happen you know and you'd kind of be laughing at each other you know saying well, look at them idiots in that cult um <laughs> which is always funny isn't it <laughs> like y'all were like duking it out on the street corner duking it out for christ yeah <laughs> but what, what you'd normally do is is find a way to talk to them because it kind of did, did everybody a favor because you could sort of count your time because jehovah's witnesses are accounting time all the time that's oh. They okay. sort of have to make a certain amount of hours in the ministry. So um, that, it would be quite good, actually, if you could have a chat to a Mormon because you could have a long talk with them and they'd probably find it, find it quite good because they didn't have to go knocking in any more doors. Right. So kind of suited us both. We we all would um, sort of sit and talk to each yeah, other. Yeah. Did, did y'all like, did, did anyone ever like going door to door? Like, there are oh. some that claim to like it, but um, I absolutely loathed it. Although I did it as a full-time minister. So I did it 90 mm. hours a month, like as a full-time job. Um, oh I hated it. I really did hate it. That's, it that's what about horrible. you? Did you like doing it? Heck no. <laughs> <laughs> I was also very good, especially like so subservient, even as a little girl, like I, I was not used to speaking to the outside world, much mm. less men. 
and I felt I couldn't make eye contact. I was also um, un- undiagnosed autism and ADHD. I wasn't diagnosed until maybe two or three years ago, actually. And so just thinking back, like I was so awkward and so sheltered and had no, just being homeschooled, had no idea how to interact with human beings outside of like a church congregation. Yeah. So, oh, I absolutely detested it. I hated it so much. I was like, I would rather do anything than, than to go door to door. Ugh. It's like a chore. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I wanted to just briefly touch, if that's okay with you on the, the child rearing piece. Um, sure. Cause I think that is an important bit. And I know that that's something you've talked about on your, um, on your content and you've talked about it on other podcasts as well. Yes. Um, I know it's quite, it can be quite difficult, so we don't have to go on and on about it if it's too uncomfortable or, or brings back too many bad memories, but obviously it's, it's an area that um, these groups tend to have a very strict way of bringing up children. Um, can you tell us a little bit about how that works within these groups? Absolutely. So there was a primary book that I've talked about on a lot of my videos is the book called to train up a child, which is written by Michael and Debbie Pearl and, um, and it focuses on corporal punishment for children. And so that that's taught from, from birth, really, they, they want your child potty trained by the age of six months and they go, you know, they, the whole thing is they want obedient, well-trained, submissive children. Um, and so a lot of their methods would involve child torture and um, abuse psychological and physical. Um, there's, I've posted in one of my videos, a little clip of Michael Pearl, even in, in a presentation he did, there's a YouTube a clip where he's saying sometimes the psychological torture is worse than the pain. So he knows these people know what they're doing and they mm-hmm. specifically do it to break children down um, and, and basically make them, you know, disassociate and just be submissive to whatever they want. So um, a lot of their teachings are around using whatever means necessary to quote unquote, break your child. Um, they, they talk in their books about using tree branches for older kids, um, like PVC pipe, PVC pipe, which is like plumbers piping or weed eater cord. Um, basically, you know, paddles, my dad constructed a paddle for us. And so it was like, there's all of these things that they highly encourage and joke about as when it comes to breaking your child. Um, they don't, you know, if they don't allow children to cry at nap time, even babies at nap time, or, um, there has been a lot of talk recently, I feel like in the, in the news and media about the blanket training, what they call blanket training, because the new documentary that came out on net, I, I think it's no, it might be Amazon called a uh, shiny, happy people. It's about the yeah. Duggar family. Mm-hmm. And so I was raised here in Arkansas by the Duggars. So there's a lot of you know, uh, overlap there and they use the blanket training. A lot of the teachings of the pearls as well. And that's basically where you set out the baby's blanket. You lay your baby on the blanket and set some of their toys on the outside. So when the baby starts going for their toy or the food, whatever you've set over there, they get punished, they get spanked or whipped or hit um, because you don't want them to go for that toy until you tell them to go for that toy, which is again, it's, it's absurd. I don't know. I can't imagine. I have a son and I can never, I cannot mm-hmm. imagine ever put, like setting him up to fail that way, like setting him up to get hurt on purpose and then thinking you're doing him a favor is this wild. It's mm-hmm. uh, that's shocking. I mean, we don't even train animals that way anymore. Um, right. you know, uh, animal training is supposed to be, you reward based. the thing that <laughs> mm-hmm. you want mm-hmm. and you ignore the thing that you don't want essentially. Um, right. And yeah, I, I was, um, before we spoke, I just did a little bit of research and just very simple research, just looking um, on what's been reported on it. I mean, back in 2013, the BBC uh, were talking about this. There's a couple of quotes there, which I'm sure you've you've read. Um, but one of them here, if you have to sit him on, if you have to sit on him to spank him, then do not hesitate and hold him there until he is surrendered. Defeat him totally. So this is the mentality. It's not, it's not an exaggeration, is it? This is their actual words. 
Yeah, that's their actual words from their from their book. And that's the whole thing is like, it, you know, if your child pulls away, even during one of these sessions, that's the sign of rebellion. And he needs to he or she needs to be disciplined even more like mm-hmm. you, you like you just read. It's about submission, whatever, at whatever cost. Um, yeah, so it's no it's no exaggeration at all. There's been uh, the death of three children have been linked to this book as well. Unfortunately, this book is st- is still available to purchase on Amazon here in the United States. Um, Amazon won't remove it. They, you know, they said you're fr- you're free to leave a review on the book, but you're only allowed to leave a review, of course, on Amazon if you've purchased the book. So the majority of the people leaving reviews are their followers. So of course, mm-hmm. it's going to have a higher rating, but it is. Mm-hmm. It is a book on child abuse. It's not a book on child, you know, rearing or um, being a better parent at all. No, I was wondering about this when we were looking. We saw it's on the UK Amazon as well. And we were just wondering, I was just thinking, is there any way to like stop it being allowed to be in these places? So I guess that's some some homework for me to look at. Is there a way of getting it? Hold and like you know right right i know there was a petition years ago to have it removed from amazon mm-hmm. um but amazon did they they released a public statement again saying like you can you can say online how you feel about the book and that's fine but um basically they're not going to remove it which is like mm-hmm. you can't you couldn't write a book about abusing the elderly and publish it and have that on Amazon or how to abuse animals and have that published on Amazon, but somehow mm-hmm. they're getting away with having this published and, and remain on there. It's it's, but you know, that's religion, I'm especially say, religion. Think it's religion. That's yeah, of course. It. It's like, it's like the religious freedom here in the United States, at least is held so much mm-hmm. higher than anything else. It, I mean, that's even the case when it comes to removing children from abusive households and that's how people get away with it. And some of the people like the pearls and other religious leaders in the evangelical world literally train their people on how to respond to law enforcement who comes to ask questions about the abuse of their kids. Because when you're abusing your kids at this level with tree branches or holding them down and beating them, they're going to have marks. They're going to have well, like, you know, mm-hmm. lesions on their bodies and things like that. So it's multifaceted because that's also why they homeschool is so we're out of the public eye and they can abuse to whatever level that they want. Um, but also they will train the parents on how to speak to law enforcement to get them from having right. their kids taken away or to basically manipulate the authorities and use like my, use your religious rights to keep your children type of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, or yeah. So it's just, it's so deeply rooted in our culture here it's it's disgusting Uh, and of course so this is a an area that we we you know you might not want to get into but um it it's based i mean even the 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 title of that book is is based upon proverbs 22 6 um training up a child in the way he should go and when he is old he will not depart from it and there's another proverb that talks about not sparing the rod and these are the justifications for these sorts of practices and um mm-hmm. I, I must say in in my group Je- my ex-group jehovah's witnesses they um they they didn't um go in for that extreme sort of behavior but th- there was definitely a culture of smacking or spanking as as may be and um you know we'd see that in the even in the kingdom hall with children being taken out because they were being noisy um mm. you know and you'd hear the spank in the in the back room mm. um so it was part of the culture but not to the extreme that that you you've been describing but i guess um what's your thoughts around that that sort of use of the bible to determine our uh how we should behave and, and what we should do uh, have you got any thoughts on that I do have thoughts on that for sure. Um, I don't think that if Jesus were in the same room, he would approve of an adult ever hitting a child for any reason. There's never a reason to abuse or to bully your children. And I can't imagine that Jesus would be in anyone's corner when it comes to hurting little children. He said, suffer the little children to come unto me. Um, and I've said before, I said, he said, suffer the little children to come unto me, but you're making the children suffer. And there's a major difference. And I know with evangelicals, they like to take one of the things is they want to take the Bible. Literally, they want to take it like exactly what it says. Um, there's also another verse that says, beat him with the rod and he shall not die. 
and they take that literally. <laughs> um, and same with the other verses that you said as well. So mm-hmm. they're like, well, I mean, it's justifiable because it says it in Proverbs. And so um, we're going to fo- follow the Bible to a T. But, um, you know, Im- imagine letting a little child who's just doing little child things, such as wanting to reach for their toy or they're crying because they don't want to take a nap, perfectly normal baby behaviors, um, or even a teenager, a teenager, like that is, that is part of being a teenager is rebelling and figuring out who you are and finding your voice. And all of these are such normal things for any person. And you're breaking that because you want to hide behind religion as a, a cop out to abuse. Yeah, that's uh, that. That's very well said. Um, I, I have you got any more questions, Celine, on on this? Um, I, I um, wanted to also ask something else, but um, over to you. No, that's right. If you've got something on this, and then I was going to ask something aside from that afterwards before we finish. Well, I want <laughs> I wanted to know about um, the 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 journey out. So before we oh, yeah. uh, run out of time, uh, yeah, that's I that's to what I was going to ask. Is about. Yeah, thoughts? sorry, I thought you meant <laughs> carrying on with the with that side. Yeah, I was going to ask like, yeah, the the positive of getting out um and like yeah kind of that that journey and discovering yourself which is great (laughs) yeah so uh, as I mentioned earlier I I did run away when I was 18 um I ended up two weeks later uh, marrying someone who was actually from the same cult upbringing um and out of that relationship is my son who is 15 now um and he's an amazing amazing child I've uh, you know I've And I use him as an example, as just the difference in how I was raised, because I've never spanked him, much less beaten him or abused him. And he is so smart and kind and thoughtful and has never, you know, he, you know, it's, that's the thing is when we show respect, we get respect. And when we show kindness, we get kindness, but you cannot abuse your kids and and hit your kids and expect them Mm -hmm. to have any sort of meaningful relationship with you. And so I, you know, right now it is very challenging age being 15, but he, you know, I've seen the difference in how he's been raised and how he's able to communicate his feelings and, you know, um, just emotionally process things at a much better level than I ever learned how to do until I was well into my late twenties and probably early thirties. Um, and so that's been one of the biggest um, pieces of joy for me as an adult and getting out, um, is being able to see him flourish as a child and to be able to be a child and experience those things. And, um, just <laughs> like we, we mentioned earlier, like it's, it's a gift of like what, um, you did Stephen for Celine is like the gift of, um, shielding them from religious trauma and, um, that doesn't make us heroes. It just makes us decent parents, <laughs> you know? And so I don't, I'm like, I don't need praise. I'm, I'm not doing something fantastic. I'm just doing the right thing. And it's what we should, you know, I feel like we should all be doing for our children, um, to each their own with their, their religious beliefs, but, um, sure. you know, don't hit your kids. <laughs> um, <laughs> <Good advice>. but- <laughs> I said what I said. <laughs> was it your having your son that was a big sort of um, trigger for you then when you were like okay I've got to fully get away from this I yeah. need my son to grow up in a safe place yeah I um credit him for sure to be to being the catalyst to why I got out for good the second time um it's because I knew we are a product of our environment and most of the time and so if if he stayed in that environment and saw how I was treated as a woman and brought up to treat women the same way or whatever his sexuality and ended up being like, I didn't want him to be shamed in any way for anything ever. Like I just wanted to remove that entirely. And it's the same reason I went no contact with my mother because I, the more you're around that type of environment, the more it's normalized and the more you start behaving that way and thinking there's nothing wrong with it. So when my son was about, I want to say maybe a year old is when I filed for divorce from his dad. And, um, we, yeah, we got out of that for good. And, but it's been, you know, it's a long process. I got out then, but it took years and years before I could even accept the fact like, okay, oh my God, it was really messed up that I was, how I was raised and mm-hmm. my marriage. And it took several therapists telling me that, 
uh, that was actually religious cult. And it took years before I could even, I'm like, no, like, that's just how people are. Like everyone behaves this way to a degree, but no, they don't. And it wasn't, it wasn't normal and it wasn't okay. And so, um, I've only recently like started publicly talking about it, as you know, this really this year speaking very openly about my experience, because I still feel like little twinges of guilt when it comes to talking about people that hurt me. And I, I hope that someday that goes away entirely, but it still is like, um, even if I'm not actively trying to protect them, I think subconsciously, I still feel a little bit of guilt speaking yeah. about that. Um, but, but now I'm just, you know, I think it's important that if you're able to speak about these things, then speak about it because I, I didn't realize to the extent that other people went through similar upbringings or experiences like with the purity culture. And it's really lonely when you get out, it's really lonely to feel all of the shame. And when you hear other people speak about it and it resonates with you, it makes you feel um, less crazy and like, okay, I, I am validated in my experience and it wasn't okay. And holy shit, maybe I need to go to therapy. <laughs> so um, I think yeah. it's it's beneficial for me to be able to speak about it. it. It's beneficial for my healing, but it's also been really tremendous in hearing other people be able to say, oh my gosh, you know, hearing your story gave me, you know, the strength to start therapy or to realize like this isn't okay or to get out myself. And I think that's the whole goal. And, uh, you know, I can't speak for you, Stephen, but I think like for me and a lot of other people I've talked to that have gotten out and speak about it is like, what's, what's the point of getting out if you don't help others get out as well in some capacity, it's not our job to save everyone else, but you know, it's, if it can be helpful for people like me to share my story and it also helps other people get out or find resources once they're out, I think it's a beautiful thing. Yeah. It's very rewarding when you, when you get some feedback that says, you know, it's been really helpful um i have to agree i would say though that i don't feel like we should um those of us who leave i don't feel like we should feel sort of like we have to um Mm because there are lots of people that don't want to speak out and that's absolutely cool as well and and like you it took me a long time before i wanted to talk about it it's really only the last sort of five years that i've started to talk about it publicly and i've been left 25 years so you Mm. know it's taken a long long time so yeah i totally identify with all of that um i'm really interested in identity in in the work that i do but also in in relation to um coming out of these groups um so i i think that's an area that those of us who were raised in these groups have a lot of challenge quite there's quite a lot of challenge associated with coming to terms with who you are um because your your identity is kind of so wrapped up in this group and the set of beliefs um was that something that you you found you had to work on uh, like who am i now and what mm-hmm. do i care about how do i you know what should i think about this and that yeah. did you experience some of that stuff kendra yes before before i answer that question what you said i think is really important about just because you're out doesn't mean you have to share your story Um, I also follow this other lady whose grandfather started the children of God cult and she's, um, she's written books about it. She's uh, like very educated. And one of the things I've heard her speak on is that she doesn't even recommend people to even begin to share their story until they've been out for at least a decade, because Mm -hmm. that's how deeply ingrained these things are. And it takes an enormous amount of time to uh, decompartmentalize and to heal and to come to terms with a lot of things. And so even if it's decades and decades, or even if you never speak about it, 100% okay, we do, we're not obligated to ever share our story. Um, if you do, it's fantastic. But if you don't, that's also great. Your mental health and your journey is individual. And that's the most important thing is taking care of yourself. Um, so I just wanted to to say that real quick, because I thought that was a great point. Um, then the other piece of that was finding my identity. Very, very difficult. Sometimes I I think I'm still finding it sometimes, honestly, um, because again, with, with cults and part of breaking people down is um, removing your identity, your sense of self, your personality, you become kind of this cookie cutter. I was going to say cookie cutter Christian, but uh, whatever you identify in these type of 
high demand religious groups is like very cookie cutter to act and behave and live your life a certain way. And so when you get out of that, that's such a huge part of your identity. And then you're left with basically a blank canvas. And I think a lot of times when people speak to me about like, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you got out. Like that must've been amazing to finally be free. And yeah, it was, but it was also horrible and scary and terrifying because I'm like, I don't know what to do now. I don't know where to start, like where to go. I don't know what my voice even is. I don't even know my own opinions. Like, and so I don't know my own beliefs if they're not tied to this religion. So it's very isolating and lonely and confusing. So it's taken me years and years, um, especially when you're a parent. I think at least in my experience, once I was out, so much of my energy and mental capacity was spent in surviving. It was just about survival, um, being able to pay the bills. So me and my son aren't out living, you know, in a box under a bridge somewhere. So it was like, I didn't feel like I had a luxury of even learning about myself and dealing with that piece of it until probably 10, yeah, 10 years at least. Um, And so, so now even, and still figuring out, you know, about my opinions or feeling maybe more comfortable sharing my opinions. I think I've always been very opinionated um, and very <laughs> like, you know, I, I know what I like type of thing, but I also the the big piece of shame with any religion is feeling guilty for having your own opinions that aren't the same as the organization in which you were raised. So even if I've had those strong opinions deep inside, it's, it takes a long time to be able to put that into words and to verbalize it and to feel comfortable um, saying those things in front of people, especially, or even out loud to yourself. So, um, but that's been a really fantastic and beautiful part of getting out is just wearing what I want to wear, saying what I want to say, you know, going where I want to go. Um, and the world, it turns out is not as scary and awful and damning as it was taught to me. And, um, yeah, I, I wish no one else had to experience that. Um, (laughs) Uh, I think that's, that's really great. Um, and that's a really important message. I think that we, on our podcast, we, we often want to, we always want to try and get across really, um, obviously people's experiences, some of them are heartbreaking, um, and all of them are difficult. Um, but all the people we speak to, um, who've been in these groups have, have left and they've managed to mm-hmm. get themselves out of these damaging groups. And of course, then you can explore, culture you can uh, discover music and film right. and um people <laughs> yes 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 the human race <laughs> exactly. yeah in, I, think that's a, I think that's a good point yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we we should celebrate that i think and um that's that's a great great story you know the fact that we can talk about this and mm-hmm. the fact that we've been able to um follow our dreams no matter how old you are when you get out you you still have some opportunity to do that and that's really important absolutely it's never i think it's never too late no matter how old you are i have several several followers who message me privately or commented publicly that they're in their 60s and are just now getting out or they just recently mm-hmm. got out and i just think that's it's very courageous and beautiful that you know, there is no time or age limit to getting out or to deciding you want to start a different life or you're not happy where you're at. It's, I think, more scary the older you get because you feel like that window of time is closing on just life in general. So, um, but any age you can, you can get out or, you know, start new is just beautiful. Totally agree. Mm -hmm. Totally agree. Perfect. I think I think that's the perfect place to to say thank you everyone for listening because that's such thank a thank you both yeah and thank you Kendra for joining us night. so yeah. so interesting to listen to your story and your thoughts I've enjoyed um in a weird way learning more about Jehovah's Witness as well so <laughs> this is fantastic thank you both so much and thank you to your listeners as well so. thank you. <laughs>